Hello students. Today we are going to talk about the joints in chapter 9. Learn some examples and some definitions concerning structural and functional classifications of the joints in the body along with certain types of movements. The names of the types of movements that occur between the bones of a joint. At least the ones that allow movement. So joints are points of contact either between two bones or where we have cartilage and bone or even our teeth in our in our mandible and our maxilla and our jawbone. We're going to classify the joints or what we call articulations in two ways. We can classify joints structurally as to whether or not there is a joint cavity or sometimes called a synovial cavity between the adjoining bones and what type of connective tissue actually holds the bones together will be different. Functionally, we'll classify the joints depending on if movement is permitted at the joint. And furthermore, if, if movement is permitted, how much movement is permitted? So we're going we're gonna to look at all of that. And you can go through the animations. You have to be connected to the internet in order to view these animations through the PowerPoint. And here's just a quick synopsis of the structural classifications of joints we're going to cover. We're going to look at joints which are considered to be fibrous, cartilaginous joints, and then synovial joints towards the end. We're going to look at sutures for fibrous joints, syndesmoses, and interosseous membranes. So we're going to look at three major classifications of joints that are considered to be fibrous, structurally classified joints. The cartilaginous joints include synchondroses, where hyaline cartilage is the adjoining connective tissue, and synchondroses do not allow movement, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, symphyses, or the symphysis uh, singular that you see there, is a joint where a pad of fibrocartilage is between the adjoining bones. The synovial joints in the body all have bones that contain the articular cartilage, which surrounds the ends of long bones. They do connect, contain a joint cavity, as I mentioned before, also called a synovial cavity between the adjoining bones, and this cavity is filled with synovial fluid. Synovial joints are the typical joints in the body that you're familiar with. Your knee, your elbow, your hip joint, shoulder, these types of joints. Functionally, the joints may allow no movement, in which case we're going to call those, <clears throat> excuse me, synarthroses. Some joints that allow a little bit of movement, called amphiarthroses. And then the diarthrotic joints, or the diarthroses. So let's look at these names real quick. On the ends of these names, you see ES, so we know that's plural. If I put IS, that would be singular. I can say this is a synarthrosis. I could also put IC on the end, synarthrotic. But if I, say, if I say synarthrotic, I have to say joint after it. This is a synarthrotic joint. These are diarthrotic joints, plural. Or this is a diarthrosis. So we could change the ending just a little bit. Now, fibrous joints do not have synovial cavities. So the three types of fibrous joints that we're going to cover, no synovial or joint cavity. The articulating bones are held together by a dense sheet, a dense fiber sheet of connective tissue. And they may either allow a little bit of movement or no movement. So fibrous joints can be synarthrotic or amphiarthrotic joints. And so these are the types that we're going to look at. The sutures in the skull, 
cranium, syndesmoses, and something called the interosseous membrane. So this is a little picture of a joint between the cranial bones that you're learning. And we call these sutures. Sutures are fibrous joints. They are synarthroses. They allow no movement. They have no joint cavity or synovial cavity. And the adjoining bones are held together by dense fibrous material, collagen fibers. And hence, they're called a fibrous joint. Now, syndesmoses are fibrous joints. There's no joint cavity. And these particular types of joints allow a little bit of movement. So they're classified as amphiarthroses. There are two basic types of examples of the syndesmoses that I want you to know. The distal tibiofibular joint which you see down here at the distal end of the tibia and the fibula. So on right here where they're held together, that's the anterior tibiofibular ligament. And since these two bones at this joint are held together by this dense sheet of fibrous connective tissue, pretty much it's a ligament. This is considered a syndesmosis. The gomphoses are the joints between our teeth and our jawbone. And so the dense fibrous material holding the tooth inside the alveol the socket of the alveolar process of the jawbone is really referred to as a periodontal ligament. So it is a fibrous joint. Now, the gomphoses do allow a little bit of movement because they can absorb a little bit of shock. So it's a very tiny amount of movement, but we still have to consider it to be an amphiarthrotic joint. Lastly, down here, we have the interosseous membrane. The interosseous membrane is a fibrous joint, basically adjoining two bones together. Here they show the tibia and the fibula. We also have an interosseous membrane between the radius and the ulna in the antebrachium or your forearm. So these are fibrous joints, the sutures and the two examples of the syndesmoses and the interosseous membrane. Now, <clears throat> this is just a table to reiterate the description of the joint sutures, syndesmoses, and interosseous membrane, and its functional classification, and the, uh, an example over here. So just review that. Cartilaginous joints, like fibrous joints, do not contain a synovial cavity or joint cavity. The adjoining bones are held together by a cartilaginous pad, cart cartilage connective tissue. They may be amphiarthrotic joints or synarthrotic joints. It depends on which example we're talking about. So we're going to cover these, the synchondroses, which are the joints that are held together by a pad of hyaline cartilage and the symphyses in the body, which the adjoining bones are held together by a pad of fibrocartilage. Here's the animation for the cartilaginous joints, so please review that. And here are our examples. So, we have two examples, really we have two examples of a synchondrosis, or the synchondroses. Synchondroses are cartilaginous joints where the adjoining bones are held together by hyaline cartilage. And so what they're depicting here for this example is the first rib adjoining to the manubrium of the sternum. So this is called a sternocostal joint. The first sternocostal joint is a synchondrosis. This particular joint is a synarthrotic joint. It allows no movement. Another example of a synchondrosis would be the epiphyseal plate. However, it's not a true joint, but it is a pad of hyaline cartilage, this epiphyseal plate, that's adjoining two parts of, a, of the bone together. Now, we only see the epiphyseal plate in growing children. As an adult, this actually 
turns into bone, or what we say we we say it ossifies over, um, and it turns into something called a synostosis, a synostosis, which is a bony joint. And so really it becomes what we call the epiphyseal line in the adult bone. Now the symphyses in the body all are in the midline of the body, which include the pubic symphysis here between the uh, right and left pubic bones of the oscoxae. Here's the left oscoxae bone, here's the right one. So this, these are the pubic bones and that's called the pubic symphysis. And then also the intervertebral discs down our our back. Those are sympathies, and so we have a pad of fibrocartilaginous substance, uh, connective tissue, if you will, uh, forming those sympathies. These are amphiarthroses. So the sympathies allow a little bit of movement, but the synchondroses allow no movement. Here's an, another table I included in here for your quick review of the description and the class functional classification with an example of the types of cartilaginous joints. The synovial joints are the rest of the joints in the body that you're pretty much familiar with. The joints between your phalanges and your fingers and your toes, your, and your wrist, your elbow, your knee joint, all of those are called synovial joints because there is a synovial cavity or a joint cavity. The synovial cavity is filled with a synovial fluid. The articulating bones are covered by the articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage, a remnant of the fetal skeleton, if you will, which we'll talk, which you've talked about and learned about in chapter six. The bones at synovial joints are held together by ligaments. So some of those ligaments are inside of what we call a joint capsule for the synovial joint surrounded by a joint capsule. Some of those ligaments are inside the capsule. Some are on the outside the capsule. If they're on the inside the capsule, we call them intracapsular ligaments. If they're on the outside of the capsule, which I'll show you a picture of, an example of that in a little bit, if the ligaments are on the outside of the capsule, they're called extracapsular ligaments. So on the inside of the joint cavity, you have synovial fluid that's involved in lubricating the adjoining bones, also for nourishment, shock absorption, all of that. There is a nerve and blood supply that goes to the outside of the synovial joint at the articular capsule that surrounds the adjoining bones. And these synovial joints allow a large range of movement relative to the other types of joint examples that I just mentioned. And so for that reason, synovial joints are considered to be diarthroses. So here's a simple diagram, really, uh, and uh, a picture of a, a, a cadaver finger over here. This is a joint, one of your interphalangeal joints at your finger. So the adjoining bones are separated by that joint or synovial cavity filled with synovial fluid. The ends of the bones have that articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage, surrounded by an articular capsule. That's a dense fibrous capsule on the outside. Lining the inside of the capsule is what we call the synovial membrane. It contains special cells called synoviocytes that produce the synovial fluid. And so functionally, these joints are considered to be diarthroses. Now, we have specialized structures that allow to alleviate friction at the movements of bones where we have contact between the bone and the skin or bones and tendons when the bones are moving to decrease that friction, we have special structures filled with synovial fluid, and they're called the bursi, that's plural, bursa, singular, and something called a tendon sheath. So these bursa are sac-like structures filled with fluid that cushions movements between the body parts as 
the bones are moving. So when they're moving under the skin or rub it, when they move and in, in a tendon's rubbing over the bone, bursa can, bursi can be placed in between those structures to alleviate that friction. Tendon sheaths are actually tube-shaped bursi that wraps around groups of tendons to help greatly reduce friction where we have many tendons in, in one place, like in your wrist. There's a bursi that wraps around all those, those tendons as we're trying to move our wrist and our fingers. That tendon sheath is allowing uh, to decrease friction and heat when those tendons are moving. Now, you don't have to go and identify anything off of these pictures, but I did want to just leave them in here to show you an example of where the bursi are. So these little circular structures you see here, kind of blue in the picture, they're not really blue in you. These are bursi. So the bursi are, are situated in and around certain joints. This is a shoulder joint. So that when we have movement at the joint, we have the other tissues slide over the bursi and not against one another. Here is a tube-like bursi, a tendon sheath, that's surrounding a tendon right here. And these structures are filled with fluid. So again, their main role is to reduce friction. Now, the different types of synovial joints can be classified based on the type of movement. Um, and so here they show what we call a gliding or uh, joint. So this is a gliding movement, which in your wrist, those eight little bones that you learn in lab in your wrist, glide past one another. There's they don't really allow angular movement, but they allow back and forth and up and down movement, depending on which bones we're talking about. So that's called gliding movement. Angular movement is where the angle between the adjoining bones or structures can either increase or decrease. So angular movements include flexion, extension, and hyperextension. Here they show... If you bend your head down, you're flexing at the neck because you're decreasing the angle right here. And if you decrease the angle at the joint, that's called a flexion. If you lift your head back up and now it's straight up and down, that's 180 degrees, that would be called an extension when you go back the other way. Now, some joints in our body allow us to have hyperextension, not all, but some, like in our neck or in your wrist, we can have hyperextension. This is when you go beyond the 180, 180 degrees. So if you decrease the angle at a joint, it's called flexion. If you increase the angle of a joint, it's called extension. If you go beyond that 180, 180 degrees angle, that's called hyperextension. They also show you that with your arm right here. If you pick your arm up, flexion, you bring it back down, it's extension at the shoulder joint, and then you can go backwards past that 180 is hyperextension. At the elbow joint, if you lift your forearm up, your antibrachium up, you decrease the angle right here to about a 45 or less, and so that would be a flexion. If you bring your arm back down to a straight line, that would be an extension. All right, so you can look at the pictures to help define these terms, but all of these terms are just going to be definitions on the test. I'm not putting the pictures on the test. Here's some other angular movements, abduction and adduction. Abduction is when a body part moves away from midline, or adduction, which is the exact opposite, is when the body part moves back towards the midline. So your arm coming up is abduction, and coming back to your side is adduction. If you move your leg out, that's abduction. If you move it back in, that's adduction. You can also spread your fingers apart or close them. If you spread your fingers apart, that's called abduction. If you close them back, that's an adduction. So again, just learn the definitions. Circumduction is a complex movement at synovial joints or diarthrotic joints. Um, not all diarthrotic joints allow this type of movement. But at your shoulder joint, if you were to hold your arm outward and then make a big circle with it, 
you have a larger circle here than you do at the pivot point. That's called a circumduction. Circumduction actually involves four different movements. It involves flexion and extension, abduction and adduction. And if you can, if you consider that if you stuck your arm out to your side and made the shape of a cone, when you make the shape of a cone, similar to what they're showing you here with the hip joint, when you rotate your, your leg in a circle, you have a larger circle at the distal end and a smaller circle at the pivot point. So that's called a circumduction. Rotational movement is when the adjoining bones move along the long axis of the bone. So here they show uh, the atlanoaxial joint right here that basically is your skull sitting on your vertebral column. And so when you say no and you rotate back and forth, that is a rotation. You're rotating around that joint, um, the atlas joint. Your arm, if you flex your arm and pull your arm to your stomach, you rotate it around the long axis of the humerus. So that would be called a medial rotation this way. Or if you swing your arm back out, that would be called a lateral rotation. Then you can see you do the same thing with your leg. You can turn it out, your foot out, or your foot in, and you're rotating along the long axis of the femur. It's called rotation. But then we also have special movements, which occur in certain places of our body. For instance, elevation and depression. Elevation and depression is where you, like the term implies, if you with your jaw, you could drop your jaw down, your mandible down. That would be called a depression because we're dropping down. But if you raise your jaw back up, that's called an elevation. Now you can protrude your mandible forward, that's called protraction, or you can bring it back into its normal position, and that's called retraction. At your foot, if you point the sole of your foot towards your midline, that's called an inversion. If you rotate the sole of your foot to face away from your body, that's called an eversion. Also, at your ankle joint, we have two flexions. If you lift your foot upward towards your shin, you decrease the angle at the anterior side of your ankle joint. That's called a dorsiflexion because you're flexing at the dorsum of the foot. But then if you plant your toes down, plant your foot down, you also decrease the angle of the joint, but it's posterior. So by planting your foot down and you're decreasing that angle, that's called a plantar flexion. Now, with regards to your radial ulnar joint, which is really in your forearm to your elbow, you can rotate your forearm, your antebrachium, upward or downward. So if you flex your elbow like you're holding something out in front of you and the palms are facing upward towards the sky, that's called a supination. If your palms are facing either anteriorly, if they're at your side, or if you're flexed at your elbow and your palms are facing towards the sky, that's called a sup supination. A supination. Now, if you have your arms to your sides and you turn your palms posteriorly to face behind you, that's called a pronation. And if you have your arms flexed at the elbow, again, with your hands out in front and you turn your palms to face the ground downward that's also a pronation so here are the, the terms with their description please learn these definitions it's going to be just definition questions for these types of movements all right so uh, just to I'll finish off the chapter with a few more things. They have some pictures here of the different types of joints I were mentioning before with what type of movement they allow. So when we have a gliding type movement, and here they show uh, some of the tarsal bones in your foot. Um, the navicular you learned, uh, the cuneiform, second and third cuneiforms are showing this joint. These allow gliding movement back and forth, right? Um, so a, a gliding movement joint, as in your, your foot and your ankle or in your wrist, is called a plane joint. 
because it allows movement in that plane. However, the angular movements uh, uh, occur at different types of joints in the body. Here they show what is called a hinge joint. Is your elbow joint. Your elbow actually is made up of two different joints. There's a joint between the ulna and the humerus and the radius and the humerus and even between the radius and the ulna itself. So there's three little joints here that allow movement. So the hinge joint is between the ulna, really what's called the trochlear notch on the ulna right here, and the trochlea of the humerus. So this spins in, the trochlea spins inside of the trochlear notch when you're flexing and extending at your elbow. But you know we also have rotation that can occur, or what we call a pivot joint. And that occurs between the head of the radius and the radial notch on the ulna. This, is the, this joint is what allows us to rotate our palms upward and downward. So when your forearm moves up, rotates up and rotates down, or rotates forward or posteriorly, anteriorly and posteriorly, that happens with rotation at what we call a pivot joint. So really the, the head of the radius spins right there in that radial notch when we're rotating our, our antebrachium. We have the condyloid joint between the scaphoid and the lunate in our wrist. This allows uh, movement with some slight angular movement in our wrist. It's called a biaxial joint. We also have the saddle joint, which is between the trapezium and the uh, first metacarpal right here. Um, that's what we call a biaxial joint. So you can go rotate a little bit up and down in this plane as well as in this plane. And then we have the ball and socket joints. This is pretty typical. Uh, here's a hip joint. The uh, acetabulum in the os coxae bone receives the head of the femur. And so that head of the femur fits in that socket. That's why we call it ball and socket. This is what we call a triaxial joint because we allow multiple movements in, in the three different planes of space. We can have rotation, backwards and forwards, so forth and so on. Now, as far as aging and joints are concerned, you know we have uh, decreased mobility as we start to get older. It just depends on you. It depends on your health. Do you work out? Do you keep your body in shape? And your genetics, for that matter. Um, and other things go into play with this. But typically, as we get older, we produce less synovial fluid. Our articular cartilage starts to thin out. We also start to, ha start to have less... Uh, ligament length and flexibility, so we can't bend over very well anymore when we're real old um, and whatnot. Now, arthroplasty is joint replacement. This is a surgery that replaces parts of adjoining bones. So everybody knows you can have knee replacement, hip replacement, and things like that. But what did you ever see what they were replacing it with? So here, just for a hip replacement, what they do is they basically surgically remove part of the bone. So in this case, the bone on the femur and or in the, the cartilage in the acetabulum uh, may be bad as we got older uh, through major arthritis, whatnot. And so they put in metal and plastic in our joints. So over here you see a component, a titanium rod right here with the shape artificial head of the femur and this would go into the bone so this acts as the head of the femur and on the inside of the acetabulum is a pad that's been reshaped plastic that they stick in there and now the person will have mobility without pain so they put all these different parts together in order to allow greater mobility when we have joint replacements all right so that's it for this chapter. Please study those tables, learn your definitions, and as always, if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm Tom Russell, signing off from Chapter 10. I'm, I'm sorry, Chapter 9.